Hello, this is Mahabeli from the American University in Cairo, and with me is Mace. Hello. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, this is Mace Imad from Pima Community College in Tucson, Arizona. Tell me, Mace, what you were telling me today about um, how you ask students about how they are and why you do it that way. So a few years ago, I, um, I was doing a study on, on um, the impact of, of stress on students' ability to pay attention, to learn, to... And um, what I found is that students... And so the study, we, we collected their saliva to look at cortisol, which is a hormone that is elevated when we're stressed. Um, but I also did a series of surveys, so they, they, they talk about their perceived stress, and there was a disconnect. So their cortisol was elevated, so physiologically they were stressed, but they really were not tuned in to the stress. Um, and so their perceived stress, they thought it was, it was part of life. When I did interviews with students, they would say to me, or I would ask them, do you know when you're stressed out or when you are? And they say, no, usually it's not until someone else tells me that I notice it. So our ability to regulate our stress has to begin with the awareness. And so I started doing things where when a student comes to me in the class or in, the, in my office or even in the class, I would say, how are you? And I always got, okay, Okay, fine. And then I started adding to it, how is your heart? And I remember, I mean, I remember the first time I asked the student that it was like foreign language. It was a physiology student and she really thought I was asking about the physiology of her heart, like um, as opposed to the, the, the social and the emotional. Um, and, and so I, seeing the reaction, I implemented this as part of my, my weekly announcement, as part of my um, interaction with the students. And the idea behind it was that I wanted them to, to tune into their heart, to tune into and to, to check in, but also connect that, how is your state right now? And how does that impact your ability to connect with the materials? To, if my heart is hurting, if I'm heartbroken, um, it's going to be difficult to, 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 to connect and delve into something um, what, because the brain is also coming in and, and prioritizing survival, if you will, over, over learning. So, and so we started doing, and I bring in the physiology and I say, look, um, the brain is, is, when the brain is scared, when it doesn't feel um, loved or nourished, we are going to go into the state of you know, wanting to be in survival. So when we pay attention and we recognize that I'm hurting, there are things we could do to negotiate and to renegotiate with the brain so we could go into a relaxed state that can help us learn. Thank you so much for this, Mace. Um, I, you were maybe one of the first people to introduce me to trauma-informed pedagogy in general, and I was just talking to you about how uh, psychologists in my institution don't seem to know what that is, even though they work with trauma patients. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I was just also talking about some of your articles on that. What are some um, other tips that you would give educators? Uh, I know you have a lot of those <laughs> mm -hmm. on... Um, beyond asking students how they are in that, you know, honest, authentic way where you really want to know how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. What are some mm -hmm. of the other things that you try to do in your teaching to support students through this um, and also give them agency to take care of themselves? Yeah, thank you for asking. So it's interesting, when I started offering these sessions, I had people say to me, is it trauma? And, and, it, and I think it took teachers some time to say, oh, we too are traumatized. So trauma-informed pedagogy is nothing novel. It is something that the K through 12 and other, other care um, sectors have been working with it. 
So I would say two things. Number one, it's really important for you, the teacher, to be in tune with your own heart. If you're, if you're trauma, when I, when I recognize the trauma in myself, it becomes easier to recognize in others. So right now I'm telling everyone, take for granted the fact that our, all of our students are traumatized in some forms of, or another, right? I think for me, empowering with knowledge is really important. And what I mean by that, so I'm talking to teachers and professors about trauma and trauma-informed pedagogy, and, and I witness those aha moments. Who's talking to the students? And I say this because, again, through my research with the students, I started offering, this is before the pandemic, I started offering these mini, call them Hello Brain workshops. And in those Hello Brain workshops, they come in, 20 minutes, they come in and they learn something about the brain as it relates to learning. And every time I would have a student, they would have this aha moment of, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know this is why I stare blank at the, at the exam. My brain checks out. I didn't know that there are, th there are things I could do. So when the pandemic started and I started offering these webinars to, student, to faculty, I also was teaching and so I was talking to my students, if you are experiencing this, if you are having that, this is all normal. And my students would say to me, thank you, I, I, I thought I became stupid. I thought I am not motivated. And you know, Maha, it took me back to being a student in graduate school. And the invasion of Iraq happened and my family, they're there and, and we lost contact with them. And I remember just reading, studying, going to study groups and, and then flunking like leaving the exam empty. And I remember going to my mom and saying, maybe I became stupid. I mean, just that sentence, maybe I became stupid. And I would say it again and again, to the point that my mom at one point said, you should drop out, because she was so worried that it was affecting my, my, my self-image. And, and it wasn't until years later that I thought, I was traumatized. I was scared. And, and I, as I began to learn more about the brain that no, the brain is not in the executive prefrontal cortex. The brain is in the limbic survival. So what I did is I went to our school administration and I said, we need to offer, we need to help students learn about the brain. So I started offering webinars and I, and I invited a counselor who can speak about the resources. And it was remarkable. It was no jargon. It was just, this is how the brain works. This is what happens to the brain when you are under a lot of stress. A pandemic is stress. Not having a job is stress. And almost to this day, on a daily basis, I get an email from students, I don't know. And they say, thank you for I didn't know this was biology. I didn't know this was physiology. So when I have empathy for myself, that of course I keep forgetting, I'm stressed, that empathy and compassion can then help me say, okay, what can I do about it? One of the, that was so touching. Thank you so much for sharing of your own trauma. And uh, one of the things that's also, uh, important is obviously right now we're all in the trauma, but there's also the post-traumatic experiences, right? And sometimes you don't realize what's going on and then you're affected by the post-trauma afterwards. But right now, so right now, uh, just thinking about the fact that students are going through this and teachers are going through this and then the teacher's own families and kids and parents, and, you know, everyone, it's, the, it's like there's no one who's not going through this, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I try based on your work and Karen Costa's work is just try to tell them, give students choices about things, um, mm -hmm. give students options, be more flexible about deadlines, uh, mm -hmm. do the minimum workload needed and things like that. But I also realize that this is a lot of load on the teachers themselves and the teachers need to take care of themselves too. 
Yeah. What are some of the things that you feel seem accessible to a teacher who's never taught online except during the pandemic? So they're already new to teaching online and that also works for students without overloading the teacher. It's this, me as yeah. a faculty developer, I, f I feel like I might be overloading the teachers with trying to take care of the students, but they need to take care of themselves too. So. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, so um, we, we want structure. It's actually in these, in these situations, the brain wants structure. But how can I let the students know that there is a structure and that structure has flexibility? So I, as a teacher, I'm going to have a plan B. And my plan B is that students are going to ask for an extension. And what will I do when they ask for an extension? So even I, though I have a deadline and I have a structure, I also have like a clause in my syllabus and it says life happens and when life happens come and we could work something out i have something in my before the pandemic in my classes where i tell the students if you don't do well on a quiz and i have a lot of quizzes you could take it again you have to write a quiz right and so what i'm doing is i am co-create help inviting them to co-create something with me. Of course, I have like just something written about how to create a quiz. And I also um, give them options to not be stuck in that quiz if they didn't do well. And so there is agency, there is, there's pride. Oh, they get so excited when their quiz question appears on the final. You know, they, I've, you know, I had a student get up and say, that's mine. I said, like, yeah, that's yours. Yeah. So I, I, think, um, I think negotiating with, with the students. So you missed a quiz. What can we do about it? Right. And, and being ready that that's going to happen a lot this fall. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Mace. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we stop? Um, no, I think what you said about teacher taking care of their heart is really important also and taking their care of themselves. Um, it is an act of, um, it's a small act of resistance to do justice by us so we could prevent the burnout and the exhaustion because our students you know, they're coming to us broken and anxious and lonely and disenchanted, but they're also coming to us excited and inspired and hopeful. I had, yeah. um, I gave various, I did various Zoom for the introduction for the class. So if you can't make this one, you could make the other one. And um, the students that were able to make the morning session came to the afternoon session so they could meet their classmates. Oh, that's lovely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, we have opportunities. Also. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to share a couple of things that I do to take care of myself. And I, I'd love it if you shared also what you're able to do to take care of yourself. I know it's hard. Yeah. So for me, I take care of myself with a community of other educators who understand me, who share my values. Uh, we talk to each other on Twitter DM and on WhatsApp from the ones here in Egypt. And then being in this conversation with you was good for my well-being. So it's my first time to talk to you face to face, but we've been in touch yes. for a long time. And this, this is like a high, high point of my day just to be with you here. Same um, and then here. the other thing that helped my well-being last semester uh, a lot was talking to my students when I was going through something too. So I listened to them, but I also shared back with them. And there was one day where they supported me more than anyone. Mm -hmm. They were the first people I saw after I'd heard some bad news, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so just yeah. to end up, just let us know, what, what are you doing for your own well-being? So I am trying every day to remind myself not to take things personally. Um, and what I mean by that is I noticed over the summer I taught a course and some of the emails I got from, you know, from the students were, I 
wouldn't I'd say not something I'm used to the language or the and it was hard not to take it actually I did take them personal like you know. um and it it took me walking away and recognizing that when we are traumatized it becomes hard for us to express ourselves and to and it's probably most likely the students were traumatized or going through going through stress so this this it, this is not about me this is not about me that is not to say that i won't be responsible but when the um yeah so so that i would say and then the the other thing was which is related to this so a few years ago i was um visiting my family and my niece was sitting next to me uh, my niece Maryam, and she, i was communicating with my boss and we were trying to plan something and we're just right back writing back and forth and my niece was looking and she's like what are you writing and i'm showing her and she said there are no emojis. She said, and I, and I said, well, we're adults, we don't. And she said, how do you know if you're kidding? How do you, so serious, where are the emojis? And I thought about it and I thought, oh, this is like so brilliant. You know, just the way we write in this very like one dimensional, how can we, can, how can we reveal ourselves? And so whatever it is, emojis or, or pictures or something um, to, to reveal who you are, your humanity. Yeah. We're together on a WhatsApp mom. group <laughs> where a lot yeah. of people share lots of pictures. I, and I share those WhatsApp stickers yes, that I yes. really like as well. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's so true. And in the very early days of e-learning, people talked about that back when they used to call things netiquette. They used to talk about using emojis because of the, mm -hmm. the text is so dry. Uh, but now is, yeah, now is a time where I think it really makes a difference to do it because there's no other, you know, ways of communication. Thank you mm -hmm. for adding that one. That's actually one that really does make a difference. I think when you start doing it, people start doing it back. Like, mm -hmm. even people who aren't used to doing it, once you get into a mode of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Mace. I'm going to stop. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. Bye.